Good morning, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. I'm down at my local playground today. Uh, my youngest son wanted to work on the monkey bars. So we'll have a few minutes of downtime. I thought I would make a video. So today, this morning, there was a post in a veggie garden Facebook group. And I've seen this kind of post many, many times lately. Somebody posted a picture of some bugs hatching on their pear tree and asked, what are these and what do I do with them? And the initial string of comments were like, burn it with fire and all kinds of gifts of people shooting flames at it. And uh, people were saying all the various insecticides that they recommend be used on these mystery bugs that were hatching. And I have seen this kind of a post repeated many, many times across many groups. And, uh, you know, I commented on it and uh, I got told by a couple of people that I just didn't have a sense of humor. But I thought I would uh, talk today about why it's important to approach insects or other bugs in our garden differently and how permaculture would view them. And then I wanna talk about some beneficial insects in our garden, beneficial bugs in our garden that are underappreciated, or you may not even realize that they're beneficial. So first, let's talk about this post and the uh, string of posts I have seen like it lately. First off, I wanna give a shout out to the Portland Organic Gardening Facebook group, which bans those kinds of comments and posts. They ban comments like spray it, kill it with fire, squish it, um, you know, ew, gross, those kinds of comments. And that may seem a little excessive, but I actually think it's really, really important. I think it's a really good move, and I think that the admin of that group is just A+. Plus. The reason that I think it's a concern when you post things like, someone posts a picture of, of a bug or some kind of egg case, and the initial responses are a slew of kill it, squish it, spray poison on it, Folks are often posting in these groups because they don't know and they want advice from other people. And when our knee-jerk reaction is to think about killing something because we don't like the way it looks, even though we don't understand its role in the ecosystem, and we tell somebody else to kill it, they may take our advice and cause a significant detriment to their garden, uh, not to mention to the planet. So someone posted recently in a group a picture of some egg cases that they had drowned in water and then wanted the identification and they were mantids. So, I mean, I would, people pay good money to encourage praying mantis in their garden. And yet this person indiscriminately killed them because they saw something that must be buggy and didn't know what it was and immediately assumed it was a problem. So it's not our fault. We have been indoctrinated from a very young age to fear nature, to be disconnected from the ecological abundance around us, to um, encourage and promote our own ignorance of the natural systems that surround us. That's not our fault, but as adults, we have an obligation now to break away from that and learn to do better. There are some books out like Nature Deficit Disorder and things like that. We actually really, really have that in Western culture, so much so that we are taught to fear things that we see in the garden that we can't identify. I recently made a video about assuming positive intent in our interactions with others online, and I think we need to have the same approach to unknown biological entities in our garden. Let's assume positive intent. When we don't know what the creature is, let's not have a knee-jerk initial response of, it must be bad, I need to kill it, squish it. Ooh, it looks different than me. It looks different than a cute, fuzzy, you know, um, kitten or a cute, fluffy duckling. It is not visually appealing. It definitely means it must be bad and I should get rid of it. It's a really uh, problematic and really detrimental view to take. And again, it's one we've been indoctrinated with since we were little. So we have to work to overcome that. What we find is that if we stop and apply permaculture principles to our interaction with things in the garden, that we begin to see the interconnectedness of all things. And instead of seeing something as um, 
inherently antagonistic and inherently detrimental, we start to look at its role, its place in the ecosystem, in the garden eco ecosystem or here in the park or out in the complete wild zone five. Once we have a greater understanding, we can better see how an organism fits in to the food web, fits in to the ecology of our place, and therefore utilize it as a resource. In permaculture, we say there is no such thing as waste. There are only resources for which we need to find a use. In fact, permaculture principle of produce no waste is one I think really applies here. It's wasteful to indiscriminately kill a plant or insect or uh, arthropod life when you don't know what it is and what its role is in the garden. So let's say you see a insect case and you don't know what it is, or you see a spider and you don't know what species it is. Taking the time to uh, educate yourself can really make all the world of difference. Cause I think a lot of times we're really afraid of things we don't understand, right? That's very normal. If we're, if we're ignorant of something, we don't understand how it works and what its role is, we, we can be afraid of it. Much like how I became a beekeeper because I was scared to death of bees, the more I learned about bees and the more I was around them, the less afraid I became. And I don't think it's any different for our interaction with other invertebrates in the garden. Permaculture principle, observe and interact, is one that I've talked about extensively. We observe, we observe again, we observe some more, and then we interact, right? So um, we not only need to research and identify what this creature is in our yard, we need to observe our whole integrated ecosystem in our backyard and say, what role does this creature fill? For instance, I recently made a video on aphids in the garden, how I could spray them with soapy water, I could spray my roses with some kind of god-awful insecticide, or I could just observe in my garden. And what I was observing was that songbirds were picking off the aphids and eating them. And later in the season, I take the time to observe that my ladybugs swoop in around June and make a feast on the aphids in the garden. So my permaculture solution then is not to spray harmful insecticides, which promote the evolution of uh, species that are uh, tolerant and immune to our insecticides. So we have to create ever stronger, ever more potent and damaging ones. Not to mention those insecticides have unintended side effects of damaging beneficial insects. So today I wanna to talk about a number of beneficial invertebrates in the garden that are predators of some of our pests. And how a lot of these, uh, not just cute little ladybugs, but a lot of these are maybe not recognized as beneficial. And you might be tempted to say, oh, it's ugly. Oh, I don't know what it does. I'm, I'm just gonna assume the worst. Take a moment, pause, assume, Start from a starting point of assuming that that creature maybe has a role in your garden ecosystem. Educate yourself about what that creature is and then make a decision on how you're going to act in order to bring balance to your ecosystem. So let me go over a few of those creatures that are much maligned, underappreciated, and do a great service to the garden ecosystem and to you, the gardener who wants a yield of food and medicine crops from your garden. With more than 2,300 species in North America alone, this group of predominantly black-colored beetles, also known as carabids, live in the soil and eat slugs, slug eggs, and the larvae of many, many species that are detrimental to our food crops. They can often get a bad rap because assassin bugs inflict a very painful bite, but these many species prey on aphids, caterpillars, and leafhoppers, which all do extensive damage to our flowers and our food crops. They are absolutely a beneficial in the garden, although much underappreciated. We have to work hard to counteract the prolific amount of arachnophobic messages in our culture. Spiders are the gardener's friend. In North America, over 180 species of orb weaver do us all the service of eating mosquitoes and many species of flies and introduced wasps such as yellow jackets. I fully admit to being scared of this bug when I was a kid because it had a pincher on its back end. But earwigs, of which there are over 2,000 species, are not in fact venomous, but they do eat sow bugs, 
mites, aphids, slugs, and slug eggs, and do some good in the garden, as well as being food for many species of amphibians and birds. All right, my kids are all done at the playground. We are gonna head home and make lunch, and then we're gonna go check on grandpa for the afternoon. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something about beneficial invertebrates in your garden and how they can be a benefit to you and how you can stop and apply permaculture principle, observe and interact in order to bring balance to your ecosystem in order to have a good yield of crops without using antagonistic allopathic methods in your garden. Thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of this video. Please check out my Patreon in the description and if you liked this video please consider subscribing to my channel. If you want to support the work I do here and you don't want to become a regular monthly Patreon supporter you can throw a couple of bucks at my PayPal that helps me keep making more videos.